So I talked about this in one of my videos with Jonathan McDowell, a Harvard astrophysicist. What about the potential for collisions in space with all of the low Earth orbit satellites? Well, just a couple of days ago, that almost happened when OneWeb and Starlink almost collided. Three, two, one, zero. Ignition, lift off. So we have a lot to talk about in today's video. And if you didn't know this about me already, I'm actually a news anchor by day. So I wanted to try a new format in my videos and do kind of like some quick headlines and talk about a couple different things in today's video. So here we go. First of all, OneWeb and SpaceX almost collided, how that was avoided and what that means for the future. Also, I told you guys about that crazy light show that we had here in the Pacific Northwest a couple weeks ago when a Falcon 9 second stage re-entered Earth's atmosphere, but it didn't all burn up. Actually, a piece was found in the backyard of someone not too far away from me here in Grant County, so we'll get into that. Also, while we're talking about the race for space and more and more satellites being launched, I think it's important to talk about Project Kuiper. If you're unfamiliar, that's Amazon's uh, low Earth orbit satellite network that they are working to get launched as soon as they can. So I reached out to Warren Redlick. You saw him in my last video. He has his own YouTube channel. He talks about Tesla and SpaceX, and I wanted to get his thoughts on Amazon's Project Kuiper, considering all of the SpaceX satellites that are already launched and how they're gonna try and be competitive with Starlink. Houston, they had a problem. Less than one week after OneWeb launched its initial batch of satellites, they were getting red alerts from the US Space Force about a possible collision with their competitor, Starlink. So why did this happen? Well, OneWeb satellites orbit a little bit higher than SpaceX satellites, and so they had to pass through the already pretty populous uh, low Earth orbit area that SpaceX occupies and that made for some trouble. So luckily the Space Force alerted OneWeb in time to avoid this collision. At 17,000 miles an hour, a piece of metal the size of a coin can be weaponized. Now is the time for a military branch with a clear and singular focus on space. And this was a close call. If they had collided, it really could have been a disaster. It could have led to a more serious space disaster that could destroy OneWeb and Starlink satellites that are in orbit. That would be from like a domino effect of colliding with each other. Elon Musk said that they disabled their automated AI powered collision avoidance system. And thanks to this, OneWeb was able to safely steer away and avoid this accident. So a portion of that space debris that was all supposed to just melt up and disintegrate actually didn't. The space debris in question was a composite overwrapped pressure vessel that the Falcon 9 lost on re-entry. That was recovered by SpaceX, but before that it landed in someone's backyard on private property in Grant County. And you know, we had our local news stations here in the Pacific Northwest posting about this and people were saying, what the heck, man? Like, that's kind of scary to have something which this vessel looks pretty big and intimidating fall out of the sky. You know, it could potentially hurt someone. Well, I did some investigation. It looks like, based on my research, that maybe that vessel was only about 25 pounds. But still, I mean, if something 25 pounds falls on your head, think about like a 25 pound dumbbell. That could really hurt you. So generally, you know, we don't really notice these types of re-entries because they either happen in the daylight or over water. This one happened to be not only very noticeable, but you know, it left some uh, remnants behind. And so that that is something to, uh, to really think about um, as maybe seeing more of that as we have more and more launches of these satellites. 
I also wanted to dig deeper into Project Kuiper. If you're unfamiliar, that is Amazon's very bold initiative to start up their own network of low Earth orbit satellites to provide broadband access. And there's a lot of competition already. You think about the fact that SpaceX plans to have 42,000 satellites eventually. They're already well over 1,400 satellites. Then you have OneWeb, you have China doing their own operation, and Amazon is trying to get into this race for uh, low Earth orbit space. Obviously, just getting started costs a lot of money. So I reached out to Warren Redlick, who has his own YouTube channel. He talks a lot about Tesla and SpaceX, and I wanted to get his thoughts on if he thinks that Project Kuiper is a worthy endeavor. Any thoughts about Amazon's Project Kuiper in the works and just that, you know, coming into play with Starlink? The problem for anybody who wants to make a comparable network is it's going to cost you more to deploy your network than it's going to cost SpaceX to deploy theirs. And the, the, if, you, if you're planning to compete with them and get into a price war, a price competition, you're lowering your your profit, your upside. I, I don't know that it makes sense to make the investment now in a second network. If Starlink is going to be able to serve 300 million people and there's sort of a first mover advantage, mm -hmm. like, you know, Uber is much bigger than Lyft. I personally have a slight preference for Lyft, but the vast majority of people prefer Uber. Um, so Uber got there first and Uber has, I think Uber is like a hundred billion dollar market cap and Lyft has like a $12 billion market cap. So the question is going to be, well, what are you going to offer to customers when they're going to say, well, look, Starlink has 42,000 satellites. You have 4,000. I don't know how many satellites Kuiper is going to have, but let's say you got 4,000. Like, why would anybody choose Kuiper over Starlink? If I'm wrong on the prop, on the, the cost story and the cost is actually higher than I'm estimating, right? And if I'm overestimating the revenue side, right? And Starlink is going to really only going to make $20 billion a year in profit. And your network is only going to make $2 billion a year in profit. How much are you going to invest in that? Right. If you're even going to be able to pull the 2 billion a year off, yeah. how much, are you, how much are you going to invest to deploy a network? That's only going to make $2 billion a year in profit. If you're lucky, I honestly think there's a, you have the serious problem of once Starlink is up, why would anybody choose your network? Also, really quick, before you go, I wanted to share something exciting with you. If you've ever wanted to represent Dishy McFlatface in public, now you can. So this is what the t-shirt looks like. Dishy McFlatface with some stars, of course. And I, I really like the design. I've never actually tried to design a t-shirt, but you know what, YOLO, why not try it out? So if you like the t-shirt, please uh, check the link in the description. You can get your own. Maybe people will start a conversation with you and you can educate them what Dishy McFlatface is and why you love it so much. <laughs> of course, if you liked this video, please give it a thumbs up. Hit subscribe if you want more content like this. And I really appreciate you guys checking out my channel. It's always great to release new content and get positive feedback that you guys are enjoying, you know, learning something new, hearing different perspectives from special guests that we have here on my channel. I really appreciate the support. See you soon.